Hi class, welcome to chapter 14, Nutrition, Fitness, and Sports. So first we are going to define a few terms. Oops, sorry. Um, physical activity and exercise. So there are, there actually is a difference between the two. Physical activity involves any sort of movement, even if it's unplanned, like housework, gardening, raking, sweeping, mopping, going up and down stairs, walking around the grocery store. And exercise is planned movement. And both of these have so, so, so many benefits. They are absolutely crucial for good health. Um, they can improve mood. They can improve sleep. They can reduce your risk of chronic diseases. They are just so, so important. This little circle here shows some of the benefits of physical activity or exercise, and you can see they are just really, really widespread, meaning they can affect all areas of life and all areas of your healthy bodily function. What is recommended? So at the very minimum, adults should do 150 minutes per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. If you want to have the best health, you should do 300 minutes. So generally speaking, 150 minutes will maintain your health, but 300 minutes will improve your health and also help with weight control. Unfortunately, the majority of Americans fail to meet these goals as we are a very sedentary society and we're not very good at sticking with these kinds of recommendations. It's almost New Year's coming around and many people might join a gym or start a personal training program and that, that is good. That is absolutely better than not starting a gym or personal training program. But unfortunately with that too, um, half of the people who start something like that end up quitting within three months. So the kind of an excitement of it dwindles with time, unfortunately. So we need to find better ways that we can get hooked into physical activity and moving and just being more active. Okay, so how should we achieve this? We will start to achieve this by first assessing where we are at. So what are we doing now? Are we doing nothing? Are we going on walks daily? Are we going to the gym? Um, do we have a really long walk maybe around campus? from classroom to classroom? Are we on a sports team? You know, do we do dance? What is it that you do that keeps you moving? Next, you should set a goal, and this should be a SMART goal. SMART goals are specific, they're measurable, they're achievable or attainable, they're realistic, um, and they're timely. So maybe you're gonna say, I will go to the gym once a week for a minimum of one hour, each time for the next six months and then I'm going to reevaluate. That's pretty reasonable. Or maybe you're going to say I'm going to walk a mile a day every day for the next two weeks. But you're not going to go say oh, I'm going to go run a marathon this weekend if you haven't done any training. You have to be very realistic with yourself. What is the best type of exercise? The best type of exercise is whatever type works for you and whatever type you think is fun. So if it works with your schedule, if it works with your budget, if it works with your time restrictions, if it works with your environmental restrictions, you know, if you enjoy it, if it's something you can stick with, that is the best type of exercise. There is no one thing that is the best. Whatever works for you is absolutely the best. Aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is with oxygen and aerobic exercise would be low to moderate intensity exercise because you still are able to breathe and aerobic exercise is very good for our heart and our lung muscles. Muscular fitness. Muscular fitness includes three components, strength, endurance, and power, and this can be done by completing resistance exercises. So example, lifting weights or going to the gym and using weight machines or doing exercises with your own body weight, pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, lunges, squats, anything like that would help improve your muscular fitness. 
This also helps reduce your risk of many chronic diseases, such as osteoporosis. When you do weight-bearing exercise, that helps strengthen your bones, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. Flexibility. So flexibility is an area of fitness that is common over, commonly overlooked, but is actually very beneficial. It won't necessarily help you burn calories or maintain weight, but it will help with balance and stability so that you can complete other physical activity tasks. Energy sources for exercising. So how do our muscles get energy? Our muscles rely on ATP for energy, as does our entire body. And what will happen is we will separate those high energy phosphate bonds from ATP and ADP will be formed. There are actually many sources that we can use to make energy for muscles. ATP can always be used. However, it is possible that we might kind of exceed our use of ATP compared to our production of ATP, and then our ability to move or be physically active could slow down. And so we're gonna review kind of how we can get energy for movement. So ATP, we can use it. Phosphocreatine, phosphocreatine is used always in exercise, but specifically for very short, intense bouts of time, like maybe a very short sprint or a jump or a hop or a lunge, or you're playing tennis and you, you serve the ball really quickly, or you're doing powerlifting and really quickly you lift the heaviest weight you've ever lifted. That's where creatine can come in. Carbs can be broken down for energy under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And aerobic conditions I just talked about, this is kind of slow to moderate pace conditions. Anaerobic conditions occur when you are not getting enough oxygen to your body, to your cells. And so this would be under high intensity exercise. Protein can be used for fuel for exercise. However, it is not our body's preferred fuel, um, but it, it can be used. And fat can also be used. We do have quite a large supply of fat in our body. And so this is a very good source, especially when the the energy intensity is low to moderate. Okay, so let's start with glucose. So if we are in anaerobic conditions, meaning we are physically being, you know, at a level that's very intense, it's hard to talk to your friend at this level, it's hard for you to catch your breath, maybe you're running or you're sprinting or you're playing soccer, or you're playing basketball. Um, then our body uses an anaerobic system, meaning without oxygen, to break down glucose. And glucose can be converted to pyruvic acid. However, under anaerobic conditions, pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid. Lactic acid can be shuttled back to the liver and metabolized through the Cori cycle. However, this process only yields about 5% of the energy that aerobic respiration or aerobic glucose breakdown yields. Okay, so aerobic metabolism. When we have oxygen available to our cells, we are able to use it in aerobic breakdown of glucose. And in this, we're going to have glucose run through the complete cycle, the electron transport chain, um, the Krebs cycle, et cetera. And this will produce a lot of energy, lots of ATP. However, this is a pretty slow process. And so if you are doing activity that requires a high level of intensity or speed, you're not gonna be producing ATP quick enough from this process. Hitting the wall can happen. So hitting the wall can happen once we have depleted our glycogen stores. Remember, we are breaking down glycogen that's stored in the liver and muscle to glucose, and then we're sending glucose through um, glycolysis, the electron transport chain, and uh, the Krebs cycle. We can run out or run low on glycogen as well as circulating blood glucose levels. And when this happens, it usually leads to a decline in physical performance as well as mental performance. Some athletes call this bonking or hitting the wall. 
fat breakdown. So when will we start using some of our very, very uh, large sources of fat? We have lots of fat storage on our body. This is kind of our almost endless place where we can get energy from. So we can break down fat from our cells. It will supply twice as much energy as carbohydrates. However, we can only do this process in moderate or low intensity exercise because oxygen is required. That, like I said, is a very plentiful source of energy. It can provide a lot of energy, twice as much as glucose. Um, however, this can only happen at this low intensity. So this can work for like long distance runners or people doing marathons or triathlons, but not necessarily sprinters or jumpers or power lifters. When are we gonna use protein? So protein also can be used for energy, for movement under aerobic conditions, meaning oxygen is available to the cells. And most of the energy that we get from proteins will come from the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. How many calories do athletes need? Do you think all calorie needs are the same for every athlete? I hope you thought that the answer to that is absolutely not. All athletes are very different depending on what sport or what activity they're doing, what their body size is, what their body composition is, what percent lean muscle versus adipose tissue, um, their genetics, their hormones, their age, their gender, just so many things that play a role into their calorie needs. There are some general rules of thumb. For moderate activity, five to eight calories per minute can be acceptable. For more intense activity, sometimes 10 calories per minute is needed. And it's important to measure body fat and body weight when anybody is starting kind of an exercise, exercise routine because you want to make sure that they are able to maintain a healthy body weight and a healthy level of body fat. Sometimes if people exercise excessively or don't consume enough calories while exercising, they can lose a significant amount of body fat. And in women, this can lead to missed or irregular periods, um, bone loss, and many other types of issues. Carb intakes. So carbs are what our muscles really, really like for energy. And eating carbs helps prevent chronic fatigue and helps load the muscle and liver with glycogen. So there's plenty of glycogen to break down into glucose and create ATP. Fat and protein. We should also consume some fat, not excessive fat. We should focus on monounsaturated fats because as we are more metabolically active, actually more free, free radicals will form. Um, and monounsaturated fats have some kind of anti-inflammatory functions. Also, trans fats and saturated fats are less healthy for a athlete. Protein needs vary significantly. 0.8 is the regular RDA. However, the regular RDA is not set to maintain or allow athletic performance or muscle growth beyond what's needed just for day-to-day -day activities. And so there's a lot of thought that athletes may need much more protein than the RDA levels. There is not an RDA set for athletes. However, there's a very broad range between 0 0.8 to 1.7, depending on the activity level of that athlete, um, the intensity level, et cetera. Vitamins and minerals. So because most athletes consume more calories, most athletes do get sufficient vitamins and minerals. There are no separate RDAs for vitamins and minerals for athletes. However, because when somebody is athletic, they are burning through ATP faster, you could look at athleticism or physical activity would probably be a better way to word it as a metabolically active process. And as you are more metabolically active, all of those cycles in metabolism are being utilized at higher rates. And hopefully you remember that metabolism, breakdown of glucose, um, fats, proteins, 
all requires many, many vitamins and mineral cofactors. And specifically, the B vitamins are some that are required in pretty high amounts just to allow metabolism to continue. Antioxidants. I did mention that um, with this increased metabolism, there is higher percentage of reactive oxygen species generated. And so antioxidants and anti-inflammatory type compounds or things that we can eat in our diet are definitely beneficial. Our body does have its own way of partially adapting to this and our own actual internal antioxidant system increases as we increase training. Iron. So you absolutely do not want to be a athlete or somebody who's trying to be physically active with an iron deficiency because iron deficiency is going to lead to suboptimal blood and nutrient transfer to your cells, which is then going to leave you feeling very fatigued, tired, low energy, weak, lethargic, pretty much the opposite of how you want to feel when you're doing physical activity. It is possible and very actually common for athletes to develop many different types of anemias. One type of anemia that is commonly seen in athletes is called sports anemia. And in a sports anemia, when somebody has just begun kind of a sports routine or a physical activity or exercise routine, their body compensates by increasing blood volume. However, it takes longer for our body to make red blood cells than to just increase plasma volume. And so for a while, if your blood was tested, it would actually look like you have low levels of red blood cells. This type of anemia is not harmful and um, usually will correct itself, but it should still be kind of monitored. Many female athletes are iron deficient. Um, iron is lost during the menstrual cycle, and so this can significantly contribute to female athletes being deficient, as well as potentially some eating disorders that are often seen among competitive female athletes. If you have normal iron status, you should not supplement with iron, and the reason for that is in excess amounts, iron is actually a pro-oxidant, and iron can cause gastrointestinal irritation. So you would not want to take an iron supplement without first consulting with your diet doctor and having your iron levels measured. Calcium in athletes. So often when people are trying to cut weight and you know lose body fat, lose body fat, fill a certain image, they may be cutting calories and they may be cutting nutrient sources. And calcium is commonly something that ends up being low because of this. It's not that they're intentionally limiting calcium, but because maybe they're not eating enough as much cheese or dairy, or maybe they're not eating calcium-rich veggies, or they're not drinking calcium-rich orange juice or having fortified foods, um, their calcium levels can be low. This is especially typical of females who are already having irregular menstrual cycles because when you see an irregular menstrual cycle in a female, that generally means she's getting inadequate calories and she has suboptimal body fat. This can put women at risk or anybody with low calcium, but at risk for stress, stress fractures. Stress fractures occur without you actually doing anything. So you're running, you're playing a game of soccer, and then you go home that night and wow, your leg really, really hurts. And it, the pain gets worse and worse and worse. It just starts hurting. In the morning, you can't walk on it. You go to the ER. Doctor says, oh, you've got a fracture. Stress fractures don't happen because you fell or you tripped or somebody hurt you or you got in an accident. They happen just by normal everyday use, and that's why they're called stress fractures. And they're actually likely to reoccur throughout life if this happens during adolescence or early adulthood. Fluid needs. Obviously, hydration is going to be very important to athletes, and athletes are going to need more fluid than the average person because their moving muscles are actually producing a significant amount of heat. And remember, one of the main functions of fluid is to help regulate our body temperature. So fluid is absolutely crucial to athletes. 
When athletes are thirsty, this is actually a late sign of dehydration. And so it's important that athletes who are working out or anybody who's being physically active and sweating or losing fluid is drinking during an event. You want to replace all fluids lost and you also want to replace electrolytes lost, so things like sodium and potassium. In order to monitor your hydration, you can look at your urine, both color and frequency. Um, you can actually measure your weight before and after physical activity. You can assess the status of your mucous membranes, and by that I mean, is your tongue dry? Is your are your eyes dry? You know, is your throat dry? Do you feel kind of dried out? Sports and energy drinks. So, if somebody is participating in physical activity that lasts longer than 60 minutes, a sports drink might be a okay drink for them. If they're participating in activity that's longer than that and sweating, I would say definitely a sports drink. Sports drinks can be good because they have a low level of carbohydrates and they have some electrolytes like sodium and potassium. But all of these amounts are pretty low so that the body can absorb them pretty rapidly. And the body can actually absorb the fluid in the sports drinks pretty rapidly as well. Energy drinks. Energy drinks to me are a no-no. Um, these would be things like Red Bull, Rockstar, Monster, etc. They have way too much sugar. Some of them have more sugar than a soda. They have additives. You don't even know what they are sometimes. And they have caffeine. Caffeine has some role in physical performance, which we'll talk to talk about at the end of this chapter. However, one thing that caffeine does is it inhibits something called antidiuretic hormone. And antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that helps your body conserve water. And so when you have a lot of caffeine on board, that hormone is not inhibited and you have higher urine losses of fluid. So it is possible to cause some sort of dehydration from especially extreme caffeine um, consumption. And the problem with these energy drinks is they don't all say how much caffeine is in them. So they could potentially be very dangerous. How do we maximize carb stores before an event? So you may have heard of carb loading and carb loading is something that actually works very well. The goal of carb loading is to increase your muscle glycogen stores. And how you carb load is by increasing carb intake towards an event and decreasing energy expenditure. So you're decreasing the amount of glycogen that you're asking your muscles to break down and release, and you're increasing the amount of carbohydrate, which can then travel to your muscles, be stored as glycogen. People who carb load, meaning they're significantly ramping up their carbs, ramping down their exercise before an event can actually increase their muscles capability to store glycogen and so they can rely on that fuel source for longer than had they not carb loaded. What else? So what should you do during an endurance event? If you are running an endurance event or competing an endurance event, maybe a long bike ride, a long you know, marathon, ultra marathon, an overnight race, something like that, your body wants carbs. It wants carbs more than any other thing. And so you might not have time to stop and eat these carbs, so you need to be eat, eating them during the event. Also, because this is a long endurance event, meaning it's going to continue on for multiple hours, you don't want to run out of carbohydrates or glycogen and bonk or hit the wall. Some Research has said that potentially using different sources of carbohydrates, glucose, fructose, uh, maltodextrin, etc., might help maximize absorption. And the reason for this is that they may have different absorptive routes as well as different receptors. And so that could potentially be beneficial. This, in theory, might help reduce gastrointestinal side effects and help speed up the time at which these sugars can reach your cells. 
Some experts recommend amino acids with protein during exercise, and specifically these would probably be the branch chain amino acids because your muscles can use those for energy. Consuming fat doesn't really do anything for you during physical activity, and it may kind of slow down your digestive tract and make you not feel very good, so it's generally not recommended. We don't need to eat fat while we're exercising um, because most of us have plenty of our own fat surrounding our body that we can break down. After you have exercised or completed physical activity, you want to replace everything that you have used up. Just think of yourself as like a car. You know, you had to drive a really long distance or you had to drive somewhere really fast. When you drive really far or you drive somewhere really fast, you use up all your fuel. And so your body is kind of your car and all the nutrients you eat are your fuel. So you want to fill your tank back up and you want to fill your tank back up with healthy substances. So you need to have some carbs. This is going to replace all the carbs you've lost in the way of blood glucose as well as glycogen. You want to add some protein. This will help with rebuilding muscle, muscle repair, new muscle synthesis. Protein and carb in combination works very anabolically in a building process. So that's generally the recommendation after exercise, and you want to make sure to replace any electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, maybe even magnesium, depending on um, your status, as well as replace water. If you want to look at specific nutrition for power or strength athletes, you can read about that in your book. I will not be asking you about it on our exam. Um, but if it's of personal interest to you, there's some really great information in the book. Lastly, we're going to talk about ergonomic aids and supplements because these are kind of hot topics in the sports nutrition field. And this is such, such, such a brief just dive into this. If you want to learn more, they actually teach sports nutrition at Cuesta and you can take it. I'm sure you will learn all about these different ergonomic aids in much more detail. This is a $3.6 billion industry and represents about 10% of all supplements sold. Okay, so what might help in some situations? And I think the key words here are might and some situations. So caffeine. I already said we would talk about caffeine later. Caffeine actually may help some. It might help fuel muscles and it can help them feel more alert, help you feel more alert in moderation. Um, I already talked about it inhibiting antidiuretic hormone, potentially leading to dehydration, but potentially if you consume, say, two to three cups of coffee or a similar caffeine load before exercise, it might help you. Um, and everybody reacts differently to caffeine, so you would need to kind of test this before an event and really understand how your own body reacts to caffeine. If you are somebody who always drinks two to three cups of coffee or that caffeine equivalent, you will probably have a, la a lower response than if you are somebody who never drinks coffee or caffeine. Creatine. So creatine can help for very, very rapid, intense um, physical activity. Doesn't help at all for endurance, only will last a few seconds, but potentially if you're taking a creatine supplement, it might help you max out that last repetition when you're in the gym lifting weights, or it might help you push a tiny bit harder through that sprint, or maybe jump a little bit higher on a jump, something like that. It's not helpful for long distance or endurance at all. Sodium bicarbonate. Baking soda. So to me, this is quite an interesting one because it's so normal. Like who doesn't have this in their pantry? It's also very, very inexpensive and it works, but nobody's trying to market this. It's kind of, it's kind of a question. So the idea with sodium bicarbonate is it is a base and the theory is that it would help neutralize acids that have built up in the muscle or bloodstream that kind of cause fatigue or make us feel fatigued or achy. And it may be good specifically potentially in situations where there's like high lactic acid buildup. Other things that we're looking at, HMB, 
HMB is beta hydroxy beta methyl butyric acid, HMB. And some studies suggest that this may help increase muscle mass, but the evidence is not conclusive yet. BCAAs, these are our branched chain amino acids. There is some evidence that they may help with anabolic muscle building. Um, they may also be used potentially as a fuel source for the muscles. I think so, so far leucine seems to be the most potent and kind of beneficial one. And then glutamine, glutamine may promote muscle growth and all protein foods are rich in glutamine. And so this might be part of the reason why many athletes like to or choose to have high protein diets. Other things. So these are things that are out there that I don't know if they're even considered ergonomic aids, but potentially methods to enhance your performance. These are either dangerous or illegal or both. So don't do any of these. Okay, what did we talk about? Hopefully sports nutrition, you guys remember that? What did you learn? Hopefully you learned at least a little bit about carb sources, carb loading, fat use, protein use, what proteins the muscle can use, fluid replacement, electrolyte replacement, glycogen replacement, and all of those other good things. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Hope you enjoyed the lectures. Bye.